like I said earlier, I want to um, share something that is based upon our Torah portion. I want to start by taking us to Luke chapter 23, verses 13 through 25. I want to give you an understanding today and change your perspective of what happened to Yeshua and why. Luke 23, beginning with verse 13. It says, Pilate summoned the head Kohanim, the leaders and the people, and said to them, you brought this man before me on a charge of subverting the people. I examined him in your presence and did not find the man guilty of the crime you're accusing him of. Now, I want to stop there for a moment and give you a little bit of understanding. The religious leaders of Israel at this time actually didn't hold the offices that they had rightfully. In other words, they were not the ones that God had assigned to be in these roles. Amen. They were in these roles because they were beholden to the Roman Empire and had purchased the positions of leadership that they held. Okay? So, even though they were not of the priest and Levite lines like they were supposed to be according to God's instruction, they nevertheless were in these positions of authority. And because they were in these positions of authority, they held authority. There was no way for the people of Israel to say, well, you're not supposed to be there, and so we're not going to listen to anything that you say. They still had authority. They still had sway. They still had power, spiritual power, over the people of Israel because they were in these positions of authority. And so, they are bringing a charge against Yeshua of subverting the people. Now, you have to understand something. Their idea and their definition of what subverting the people was was completely different than Pilate's idea of what subverting the people was. Pilate was a... Roman Gentile. He's thinking in terms of, is this man doing something to try to incite the people to overthrow Rome? And the li religious leaders of Israel, that's not what they're thinking about when they say subverting the people. They're thinking about this guy is teaching against what our Torah has to say. Okay? So, they're using the same terms, but meaning two completely different things. So, as Pilate is examining Yeshua, he's going, he's not trying to overthrow Rome in any way. So, he, as far as I'm concerned, he's not guilty. Okay, so we, we go on. So, he says, and neither did Herod, because he sent him back to us. Clearly he has not done anything that merits the death penalty according to Roman law. Okay? Therefore what I will do is have him flogged and release him. Uh, and it says in some manuscripts they have the verse 17 for he was required to release one man to them at the festival. But with one voice they shouted, Away with this man! Give us bar -Abba. Well, bar -Abba was a man who had been thrown in prison for causing a riot in the city and for murder. Pilate appealed to them again because he wanted to release Yeshua. But they yelled, Put him to death 
on the stake or crucify him. And they said it twice, crucify him, crucify him. By the way, this is August 18th, 2012, for the sake of the video, the 30th day of Av, 5772, and I have entitled my message, Crucify Him. Verse 22. A third time he asked them, But what has this man done wrong? I haven't found any reason to put him to death. So I'm going to have him flogged and set free. But they went on yelling insistently, demanding that he be executed on the stake, and their shouting prevailed. Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown in prison for insurrection and murder, the one they had asked for, and Yeshua, he surrendered to their will. Now we need to ask some questions. Why was the religious leadership calling for Yeshua's crucifixion? So why, why crucify Yeshua? Well, I, before we answer that question, I want us to take, I want us to go to our Torah portion. To Devoim chapter 13, Deuteronomy chapter 13. Depending on what um, translation you have, in the complete Jewish Bible it's verse 11. If you've got a different translation, it will be verse 10. Verse 10 says, You are to stone him to death because he has tried to draw you away from Adonai your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of slavery. So what is this in reference to? It's talking about someone who tries to draw the people of Israel away from worshiping the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, just keep your, keep your finger there because we're going to be looking at that again. And so, the correct punishment for someone whom they considered drawing them away from the true worship of God was supposed to be stoning. So why are they calling for crucifixion instead? Well, first of all, like I said before, this particular spiritual leadership was beholden to Rome because they had purchased their position. So they were, in essence, Roman collaborators. Okay? And the Roman means of execution was crucifixion. And if indeed the Sanhedrin had ruled that Yeshua needed to be put to death, because they were under Roman rule, they did not have the authority to carry out the death sentence by stoning without approval from Rome. Okay? So they couldn't carry out Yeshua's execution themselves, not legally. They could, they, they could have done it, but they would have gotten in trouble for having done it. Okay? So, they were reliant on Rome's method of execution. But beyond that, we have in the same book in Devoim, a few chapters over, chapter 23, or excuse me, chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, The Torah reads this way. If someone has committed a capital crime and is put to death, then hung on a tree, his body is not to remain all night on the tree, but you must bury him the same day because a person who has been hanged 
has been cursed by God. So that you will not defile your land which Adonai your God is giving you to inherit. And so as far as the religious leadership of Israel was concerned, they were getting two for the price of one. Getting someone else to do the dirty work of taking Yeshua's life and at the same time Yeshua was, had the curse of God on him by being hung, by being crucified. And that suited them just fine because as far as they were concerned this guy needed to be cursed. And it tells us in Galatians 3 verse 13 It, this passage in Devoim is quoted by Rav Shaul. Actually, let's, ver, let's begin with verse 10. Now, just to have the whole paragraph, it's going to be 10 through 14. For everyone who depends on legalistic observance of Torah commands lives under a curse. Since it is written, cursed is everyone who does not keep on doing everything written in the scroll of the Torah. Now it is evident that no one comes to be declared righteous by God through legalism. Since the person who is righteous will attain life by trusting and being faithful. Furthermore, legalism is not based on trusting and being faithful, but on a misuse of the text that says, Anyone who does these things will attain life through them. The Messiah redeemed us from the curse. Okay? From what curse? The curse of legalistically yeah. keeping everything written in the Torah. Okay? So, He redeemed us from the curse pronounced in the Torah by becoming cursed on our behalf. For the Tanakh says everyone who hangs from a stake comes under a curse. Yeshua the Messiah did this so that in union with him the Gentiles might receive the blessing announced to Avraham. So that through trusting and being faithful we might receive what was promised, namely the Spirit. And so this method of execution of Yeshua... Rightfully, according to the Torah, he, if, if they really believed that he was guilty, he should have been stoned to death. But instead, he was executed by being hanged, by being uh, crucified. Well, th th that was not accidental. God didn't mean for him to be killed by stoning. He meant for him to be killed by being hanged. Because he was the curse for us, so that we wouldn't have to endure the curse. Okay? Now here's what here's where I want to begin instructing you and and hopefully giving you a different perspective of what these people did. Okay? Why did they deem Yeshua worthy of death? Well, that's found in our Parsha. And so let's go back to Ch Devarim chapter 12. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 first. Then we're going to look at a couple other passages. 12, 1 through 3. Here are the laws and rulings you are to observe and obey in the land of Adonai, the God of your ancestors. Uh, that the, excuse me, in the land Adonai, the God of your ancestors, has given you to possess as long as you live on the earth. You must destroy all the places where the nations you are dispossessing serve their gods whether on high mountains, on, on hills, or under some leafy tree. 
break down their altars, smash their standing stones to pieces, burn up their sacred poles completely, and cut down the carved images of their gods. Exterminate their name from that place. And then let's move over to verses 29 through 31. Same chapter, 12. When Adonai your God has cut off ahead of you the nations you are entering in order to dispossess, and when you have dispossessed them and are living in their land, be careful after they have been destroyed ahead of you not to be trapped into following them, so that you inquire after their gods and ask, How did these nations serve their gods? I want to do the same. You must not do this to Adonai your God, for they have done to their gods all the abominations that Adonai hates. They even burn up their sons and daughters in the fire for their gods. And then we're going to move on and read the, read the entire chapter 13. Everything I am commanding you, you are to take care to do. Do not add to it or subtract from it. If a prophet or someone who gets messages while dreaming arises among you and he gives you a sign or wonder and the sign or wonder comes about as he predicted when he said, let's follow other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you are not to listen to what the prophet or dreamer says. For Adonai your God is testing you in order to find out whether you really do love Adonai your God with all your heart and being. You are to follow Adonai your God, fear him, obey his mitzvot, listen to what he says, serve him, and cling to him. And that prophet or dreamer is to be put to death because he urged rebellion against Adonai your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from a life of slavery in order to seduce you away from the path Adonai your God ordered you to follow. This is how you are to rid your community of this wickedness. If your brother, the son of your mother, or your son, or your daughter, or your wife, whom you love, or your friend, who means as much to you as yourself, secretly tries to entice you to go and serve other gods which you haven't known, neither you nor your ancestors, gods of the people surrounding you, whether near or far away from you, anywhere in the world, you are not to consent, and you are not to listen to him, and you must not pity him or spare him, and you may not conceal him. Rather, you must kill him. Your own hand must be the first one on him in putting him to death, and afterwards the hands of all the people. You are to stone him to death because he has tried to draw you away from Adonai your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of a life of slavery, then all Israel will hear about it and be afraid so that they will stop doing such wickedness as this among themselves. If you hear it told that in one of your cities, which Adonai your God is giving you to live in, certain scoundrels have sprung up among you and have drawn away the inhabitants of their city by saying, let's go and serve other gods, which you haven't known, then you are to investigate the matter inquiring and searching diligently. If the rumor is true, if it is confirmed that such detestable things are being done among you, you must put the inhabitants of that city to death with the sword, destroying it completely with the sword, everything in it, including its livestock. Heap all of its spoils in an open place and burn the city with its spoils to the ground for Adonai your God. It will remain a tell forever and not be built again. None of what has been set apart for destruction is to stay in your hands. Then Adonai will turn from his fierce anger and show you mercy, have compassion on you, and increase your numbers as he swore to your ancestors, provided you listen to what Adonai says and obey all his mitzvot that I am giving you today, thus doing what Adonai your God sees as right. And the way that this scenario was always presented to me when I was growing up 
was they talked about these wicked, evil Pharisees. These wicked, evil Jewish people who crucified the Messiah. But what I want you to understand is even if this spiritual leadership in Israel were they were not the rightful ones that were supposed to be in authority according to God they nevertheless were in authority and even though they might not have done things exactly the way they were supposed to do them and even though they might be spiritually blinded according to Yeshua they nevertheless were trying to do what they were in the position to do. They were trying to be faithful to what the Torah says. And according to them, Yeshua was preaching and teaching something that was contrary to what they believed the Torah said. And that, they, that he was trying to lead them down a path that would take them away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? So they believed that what they were doing was in observance of what the Torah commands. They were not being evil in their heart. Obviously, Hasatan was using them to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. Ultimately, it was what God wanted to accomplish, and God was using Hasatan. Okay? So, here's what I want you to see from the Brit Hadashah. Now that we've read that, I want you to see for yourself what they thought about Yeshua. We can go to Luke chapter 7. Verse 39. This is the scenario where a parush, a Pharisee, invited Yeshua to come to his home to eat. And when Yeshua came, all sorts of other people came that the parush was not necessarily very happy to have at his table. And yet they came as guests of Yeshua and being, knowing the Middle Eastern rules of hospitality, since he had invited Yeshua to come and eat at his table, he couldn't very well turn Yeshua away because Yeshua brought undesirables with him. And so these folks are at the table with Yeshua and one particular woman, everybody knew what her livelihood was and she was there with Yeshua. Verse 39, when the Parush who had invited him saw what was going on, he said to himself, if this man were really a prophet, he would have known who is touching him and what sort of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And so, this is one example of where Yeshua being identified as a prophet in this man's mind, basically he's calling Yeshua a false prophet. If he really was a true prophet, then he would know what kind of woman is touching him. Okay? Yochanan, John chapter 7. Verses 37 through 52. Yochanan 7. 37 through 52. Now on the last day of the festival of Sukkot, Hoshana Rabbah. Yeshua stood and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him keep coming to me and drinking. Whoever puts his trust in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from his inmost being. 
Now he said this about the Spirit, whom those who trusted him in him were to receive later. The Spirit had not yet been given because Yeshua had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some people in the crowd said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, This is the Messiah. But others said, How can the Messiah come from the Galil? Doesn't the Tanakh say that the Messiah is from the seed of David and comes from Beit Lechem, the village where David lived? So the people were divided because of him. Some wanted to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. The guards came back to the head Kohanim and the Perushim, who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? The guards replied, No one ever spoke the way this man speaks. You mean you've been taken in as well? The Perushim retorted. Has, has any of the authorities trusted him or any of the Perushim? No. True, these Am Ha'aretz, these people of the land or the common people, do. But they know nothing about the Torah. They are under a curse. Nachdimon or Nicodemus, the man who had gone to Yeshua before and was one of them, said to them, Our Torah doesn't condemn a man, does it? Until after hearing from him and finding out what he's doing. They replied, You aren't from the Galil too, are you? Study and see for yourself that no prophet comes then they all left each one to his own home. And so the leadership, through these statements, are making known what their position is. Yeshua is a false prophet in their estimation. Okay? And then if we go over a few chapters to chapter 10, verses 22 through 42, We, do, we, we end up having this story where the leadership is dealing with things that Yeshua is saying. And in their estimation, see today in modern uh, non-Messianic Judaism, in other words, Jews that do not believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, one of their arguments against believing in Yeshua is... You Christians have taken a mere man and elevated him to the status of being God. And you are worshiping him as a God. And so they see Yeshua as a foreign God. Okay? That they wouldn't dare worship. Because in so doing, they would be turning to a foreign god, turning away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to a foreign god in their minds. Okay? Yochanan 10, 22 through 42. Then came Hanukkah in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Yeshua was walking around inside the temple area in Shlomo's colonnade. So the Judeans surrounded him and said to him, How much longer are you going to keep us in suspense. If you are the Messiah, tell us publicly. Yeshua answered them, I have already told you and you don't trust me. The works I do in my Father's name testify on my behalf. But the reason you don't trust is that you are not included among my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice I recognize them, they follow me, and I give them eternal life. Wow. You understand? They knew exactly, without him saying it directly, they knew exactly what he was saying. All of this is messianic language. All of this is language that they would expect from yod heh not from some man standing in front of them. Okay? 
This guy is claiming that he can give people eternal life. And in their estimation, there's only one who can give eternal life, and that's God. Okay? They will absolutely never be destroyed, and no one will snatch them from my hands. More God language. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them from the Father's hands. So now he's equating his hands and the Father's hands as being one and the same. I and the Father are one. Now, here, here, believe it or not, even though, you know, we don't like what this next statement has to say, they were doing, they were obeying in their minds the Torah. Okay? Once again, the Judeans picked up rocks in order to stone him. Okay? Yeshua answered them, You have seen me do many good deeds that reflect the Father's power. For which one of these deeds are you stoning me? The Judeans replied, We are not stoning you for any good deed, but for blasphemy. Because you, who are only a man, are making yourself out to be Elohim, capital E. Okay? God. Yeshua answered them, Isn't it written in your Torah, I have said, you people are Elohim. And he's referring to Psalm 82, verse 6. If he, God the Father, called Elohim the people to whom the word of Elohim of yod heh vav -Heh, was addressed, and the Tanakh cannot be broken, then are you telling the one whom the Father set apart as holy and sent into the world, you are committing blasphemy? Just because I said, I am a son of Elohim? If I am not doing deeds that reflect my Father's power, don't trust me. But if I am, then even if you don't trust me, trust the deeds, so that you may understand once and for all that the Father is united with me, and I am united with the Father. One more time they tried to arrest him, but he slipped out of their hands. So in all of these situations, they were acting upon what they had been taught in the Torah. If someone came along trying to take them away from the worship of the one true God, the command was very clear. They were to stone that person to death. Okay. Now, as we already established in the beginning, they didn't end up stoning him to death. Instead, he was crucified. But that was by that was by design on the part of God. Okay. Yes. On, on, on that section we were reading, where where it, it mentioned uh, on the on, on the deeds. Where, how does that correspond because they he raised Lazarus and that was probably mentioned before that. Right. Anyway, well if you remember what we just read in Devarim, oh he was asking um, he had done all of these mighty deeds inclu including like raising Lazarus from the dead, you know. Uh, why were they having trouble with him? basically is what the question is if he was doing all of these wonderful things. Well, that passage in Devarim which speaks about someone leading you away begins with if someone comes to you that does miraculous things, signs and wonders and these things actually, you know, they prophesy something and it actually comes to pass, etc., etc., but they're trying to lead you away, don't pay any attention to their miraculous deeds. Okay? So, in their mind, they are trying to keep what the Torah said. They were not just, it's not like what has been presented to you before. They weren't just wicked people who only had hate and 
and killing and everything in their mind and that's all they wanted to do. No, no. They genuinely thought they were serving God in what they were doing. And what, what gets me when we understand this, when I understand this, I begin contemplating and thinking about what am I doing? How much of what I'm doing is not really truly what God wants, but I, I think and I believe that I'm doing the will of God. And only the Spirit of God, you know, if we'll humble ourselves before Him and ask Him, please show us if there's something like that that we are doing. That's the only way that that can be revealed. And if we believe that we're always right and can never be corrected, that we have the truth, we have the whole truth, and nobody can tell us different, if we ever get to that place, then we will be exactly like the spiritual leadership was, you know, to thinking that they were doing what God wanted them to do, but very, very wrong in what they did. Amen. Amen. That will kind of make us, uh, if, if we take that into context of where we are in the world today, is that it will give us a little bit more compassion on Muslim people because oh, yeah. they're in that very same position. I think they're doing all this in the name of God by persecution, by stopping uh, people from evangelizing their mm -hmm. or they're changing their faith or you know, all that whole scenario. Now, obviously, what we believe is very different than what the Muslims believe. They believe and they've been taught that they expand the kingdom of Allah through violence, through taking people's lives, through terrifying people, you know, at the point of the sword. But there is one thing about them that is admirable and that is their zeal. Now their zeal is many times born out of fear that they have themselves. Fear that if they don't do what they have been taught that they will end up in torment and therefore it, they feel it incumbent upon them to do these things in order that they end up in paradise. But nevertheless, they are extremely serious about their faith and willing to do whatever is necessary to advance that faith. They have the understanding, and I actually, if, I don't know if you guys remember this, those of you who have been around for a while, I actually did a message or talk to you guys about how their, one of their goals is to just simply overwhelm the world by numbers. Yep. Right. And therefore they, they not just encourage the couples to have many children, but that's like one of the obligations that they have to have as many children as they possibly can in order to expand Islam just merely by giving birth. Okay? And what, what Christians have done, on the other hand, is believers have gotten into this place of if it's not convenient for me, then I don't want to do it. Right. Okay? And so couples are now either not having any children whatsoever because it would interfere with their career or with what they want to do or etc. etc. Or they're just having one or two or something like that. And as a result, Islam is growing by leaps and bounds as far as numbers are concerned. 
and those who are believers in God are dwindling in the earth because there's not enough children being born to not only in it we don't increase we're shrinking okay because if if you've got two people and they only have one child that is an instant reduction right there okay you understand now I'm not necessarily standing here calling for everybody get busy and have a bunch of children okay but well and that was not Nathaniel said you only had one but that was not our choice okay you know there are those situations where couples only have one but it's not because they chose to only have one what I'm talking about is choosing to have none or just one okay simply because it's inconvenient okay <clears throat> so um, they have some right ideas and I, I think there are some things about what they believe that as as believers in Yeshua we need to consider and we need to think about seriously why aren't we zealous for our God like they are for theirs I mean just start with that one answer that question for yourself well that's the politically correct answer that has developed Right. Yes. God said, be fruitful and love. He did. God gave mankind a command to be fruitful and multiply. There are other passages in the scripture that instruct people to have many children. In the psalm it says to fill your quiver full. Yes. As a side note, Muslim Brotherhood is a crucifixion. What's that? Muslim Brotherhood did some crucifixions in Egypt. Oh, really? Uh, opposition people too, and they wanted to have He's saying the Muslim Brotherhood did some crucifixions in Egypt. On them naked. <clears throat> Anyway, I, I want to share something that I pulled off the internet that I found most interesting as I was looking at this issue of the death penalty. And um, I want to share this with you because it gives you an understanding. And I, I've got a couple different things that are highlight that I highlighted on here simply because. I found it interesting to me and I actually want to do some further research on one of these things that I'm about to share with you. This is off of Wikipedia. There is a, um, a Wikipedia page that uh, I think is called, uh, is it Religion and Capital Punishment? And it deals with each of the different religious groups like Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, so on and so forth. What their take on capital punishment is. And so I took the section uh, on Judaism out and want to share it with you. The official teachings of Judaism approve the death penalty in principle, but the standard of proof required for application of death penalty is extremely stringent, and in practice it has been abolished by various Talmudic decisions, making the situations in which a death sentence could be passed effectively impossible and hypothetical. Now here's what I highlighted. Forty years 
before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which occurred in 70 CE. In other words, somewhere around 30 CE. The Sanhedrin effectively abolished capital punishment, making it a hypothetical upper limit of the severity of punishment fitting in finality for God alone to use, not fallible humans. According to uh, uh, scholarly information, Yeshua was born somewhere between 7 and 2 BCE and died somewhere between 30 and 36 BCE. Oh, excuse me, CE. And so, my, I'm wondering, because if you remember from the Brit Shah, not only, see that the last time that you read about any kind of death penalty being carried out by the people of Israel is back in the Torah. The time when the young man curses his parents, the time when the other man get, was gathering sticks on the Shabbat. Okay? There's those situations where we know that they stone people to death. But after that, you don't read of the people of Israel carrying out the death penalty again until we read about Yeshua being crucified. Okay? And then, after that, we read that Rav Shaul is actually given the authority in letter to go out and begin tracking down the followers of Yeshua and we have the story of Stephen being stoned to death. Okay. Personally, and again I have to do research, I think that the sages, the members of the Sanhedrin, came to a point where they began to understand that if they allowed this to continue, that they were on a very slippery slope that was going to take them down a path that as a people group they didn't want to go down. And I think, I think the death of Yeshua was the catalyst for the Sanhedrin actually making this ruling, abolishing the death penalty. Now, I don't have any proof for that. That's what I want to I do some research on. While allowing for the death penalty in some hypothetical circumstances, scholars of Judaism are broadly opposed to the death penalty as practiced in the modern world. The Jewish understanding of biblical law is not based on a literal reading of the Bible, but rather through the lens of Judaism's oral law. These oral laws were first recorded around 200 CE in the Mishnah and later around 600 CE in the Babylonian Talmud. The laws make it clear that the death penalty was used only rarely. And here's a quote from the Mishnah from Makot 110. Quote, a Sanhedrin that puts a man to death once in seven years is called destructive. Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah says a Sanhedrin that puts a man to death once, even once in 70 years. Rabbi Akiba and Rabbi Tarfon say, had we been in the Sanhedrin, none, none would ever have been put to death. Rabban Simeon ben Gamliel says they would have multiplied shedders of blood in Israel. So rabbinic tradition describes a detailed system of checks and balances to prevent the execution of an innocent person. These rules are so restrictive as to effectively legislate the penalty out of existence. Here's what the law requires. Quote, there must have been two witnesses to the crime and these must conform to a prescribed list of criteria. For example, 
females and close relatives of the criminal are precluded from being witnesses according to biblical law, while full-time gamblers are precluded as a matter of rabbinical law, end quote. The witnesses must have verbally warned the person seconds before the act that they were liable for the death penalty. The person must then have verbally acknowledged that he or she was warned and that the warning would be disregarded and then have gone ahead and committed the sin. No individual was allowed to testify against himself or herself. The 12th century Jewish legal scholar Maimonides famously stated that, quote, it is better and more satisfactory to acquit a thousand guilty persons than to put a single innocent person to death, end quote. Maimonides argued that executing a defendant on anything less than absolute certainty would lead to a slippery slope of decreasing burdens of proof until we would be convicting merely according to the judge's caprice, end quote. Maimonides was concerned about the need for the law to guard itself in public perceptions, to preserve its majesty and retain the people's respect. Today, the state of Israel only uses the death penalty for extraordinary crimes. The only execution ever to take place in Israel was of convicted Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann in 1962. However, Israeli employment of the death penalty has little to do with Jewish law. And so, I could go on and read the rest of the, this, but it's just like um, some statements made by Orthodox rabbis and the, and the opinion of conservative Judaism. But needless to say, and again, I, I speculate that it was because of what happened with Yeshua that the Jewish people after that point in time basically did away with the death penalty. But at the, at the time that they carried out what they did, they believed that they were keeping the Torah by doing what they did. And so, let's, let's go to the Lord as we close this message. Father, I, I believe that it's just merely human tendency to always want to be right about everything. We don't ever want to be wrong because that in our own minds and possibly in the minds of others would make us less than who we want to be seen as. So Father, I pray that you'll help us to see that these religious leaders in Israel were not all that different than we have the capability of being. That we would not look down our noses at them as just being evil, wicked people. But that we would understand that if we're not humble and we're not careful, we can tread exactly the same path that they did. And so, Father, we do come to you, we ask, in humility that you would keep us in a state before you where we can be corrected by you, whether it be directly or through a brother or sister, that we will not get to a place where we become hard, where we become immovable, where we become 
spiritually deaf and spiritually blind. Where when something new and different is presented to us that is from you, we can't hear it because it doesn't fit with what we think, what we believe. At the same time, Lord, we need discernment to not just accept anything and everything that comes along. So, Father, keep us in that place of balance to be able to hear and know and discern that which comes truly from your Spirit and that which comes from the enemy. Without this, we will be led astray. We pray these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevarech Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'nav lecha v'yikunecha In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.